Hey everyone, welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today I'm joined by Colombo Crime Family Associate, also he was a Los Angeles Crime Family Associate, Kenji Gallo. During his time in the Mafia, Kenji worked in the adult film industry as a producer. Kenji would also secretly sell a lot of drugs. After years in the Mafia, Kenji would turn informant and wear a wire against the Colombo, Lucchese, and Los Angeles Crime Families. After he completed his mission for the government, he would go into the Witness Protection Program. Kenji would go on to write a book called Breakshot about his life in the Mafia and wearing a wire against a lot of members in the Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Kenji's story. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. I'm yeah, really, no problem. Yeah, I'm really interested, man. I've been trying to get you on maybe for a year or so, <laughs> since I started getting into all this stuff, but I'm glad we finally were able to make it happen, man. Yeah. I'm glad to be on. Okay. So, um, you know, what we can do is we can start with like, uh, you know, what was your early life like, you know, growing up and, you know, cause I mean, when, when you were younger, I mean, you went to, uh, you were in the military, right? Well, no, I, I was, um, I mean, I grew up in an upper middle-class household um, both my parents are college graduates. I went to uh, private schools. I eventually went to a military school. I was in JROTC and ROTC. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, pretty much after that, I went to, a, even when I went to public school, it was a, I think it's like one of the best schools in America still rated University High School in Irvine. So I went to a school with a lot of people that are in bands now, like Rage Against the Machine or um sugar ray and then like uh yeah. actors like will ferrell you know people like that i it and then it was just downhill from there for me but it was all my choice no one else made that choice for me it's not because my life or my upbringing or my parents were evil or i don't blame it on anyone else i made these choices myself so what, what do you think made you gravitate towards uh, the criminal life I wanted it. I wanted to be a criminal. I was fascinated by criminals. I used to um, hear stories about them and, and read about them. And I just was fascinated by, you know, the outlaw life. And, uh, you know, even before that, I used to read and, and watch all these movies about the Civil War and after the Civil War, the, all the outlaws and, um, you know, the, the uh, Confederate guerrillas, you know, the guys from Kansas, you know, those kind of people. And that's what I watched. So. Yeah. So really, really gravitated to the dark side then. And then, I mean, you, you eventually started, uh, you know, doing these little crimes and stuff. What, what age were you when you first started getting into all this? Well, I was, even in military school, I loaned out money, which is not really a crime, but, you know, I loaned out money and then I would, I, you know, like I loan out five for six and then on Friday, everyone got, a, we got, a, we got an allowance and I would take back, I give you $5 during the week and you give me back six on Friday. <laughs> and uh that's that's kind of where i started that and then uh when i was in school i was like uh, you know i would do whatever if someone was going to go uh, rob something or, or break into something i would go with them and then uh i got a job at 13 in a restaurant as a dishwasher and the guy there was a huge drug trafficker and i mean massive drug trafficker and i look i saw all the and all the guys that came in were all huge Colombian and, uh, you know, other South American drug traffickers and Mexicans. And I learned, you know, I, 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 I watched them. They had like Porsches, they had the silk shirts, the gold chains, the gold Rolexes, the pants, you know, I mean, it was like, and I wanted to be just like them and I got to know them. And so I worked, I think I worked like that regular job for three weeks. And then after that, I, one guy, one time, uh, I was, I was busting a table and the guy goes here and he had a napkin and he pulled the napkin off. And there was a rock of cocaine. He goes, you know what that is? And I go, yeah. And like, I really didn't know what it was, but I go, yeah. And he goes, it's yours as a tip. And so <laughs> I, I put it in my pocket. And then the next day I told, I, there was a kid that went to military school with me, but he's older than me. He was a senior. And uh, I showed it to him and he's like, Oh my God, where'd you get that? And I go, and I told him and he's like, Dude, this is like an eight ball. And I'm like, I don't even know what it was. And so he, he weighed it out. It was like four grams with one rock. And he told me, uh, man, this, at this point, it was worth like, like, like $300. He's, you know, this yeah. is the eighties. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. early, early eighties, like mid eighties. And, uh, 
he's like, this stuff is like not even, not even stepped on, like cut. So we each did one line. And after that, I'm like, well, man, this is awesome. But I would have had the money. The money is like what I wanted. And so mm-hmm. me and him sold it and uh, we split money and uh, that was it. And then I went back to the guy, the guy that gave it to me and I asked him, hey, can I get some more? And he's like, oh, I don't really want to do piecemeal. But if you do things, you know, carry packs for me, I'll just give you some. And that's how I did it. And then I just started saving my money from there. Damn, that, that's insane. I mean, it just really, that's all it took. I mean, you always had it in you, you know, to want to be like that. Yeah. And this guy puts this opportunity in front of you and then, you know, you just take it to the next level. Was, yeah. One, one of the guys that you met, <clears throat> was was this the Joe, Joey Avalio that you're, that yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, and, Joey, Joey was the first guy I met. I mean, and he was like, I mean, he moved massive amounts of cocaine, like even like $7 million of it before from Tahiti, from from uh, Colum- from Peru to Colombia to Tahiti to Hawaii and then into Southern California. And then he was hooked up with the Medellin cartel. So I met not only those criminals there, but I also met the traditional uh, LCN, La Costa Nostra, the mafia guys there. Um, some of the guys that were in the restaurant all the time were big gamblers too. So at the same time I was in this drug thing, I, I, I learned about gambling, which is something I, I don't like to gamble. I never gambled, but I, would always be part of gambling and like i used to sell football cards for um one of the bookies there that's one of the ways i uh i got into that world too it's all it all came in together at the same time right so so, so yeah so i mean when how how long were you in the working at this you know restaurant then you know and well you made all these connections right with all these different people. yeah i i only worked there for like three four weeks maybe a month i i, I had i had my first paycheck i made 92 dollars and in like two weeks, I think it was like two weeks pay period, ninety two dollars. And that, you know, this is when when uh, minimum wage was like a dollar fifty. And I, I had it framed. And one time when my house got raided, they took it. But I had like for for 10 years, 15 years. Damn. And I used to just have a frame because like I never cashed it. And that was uh, your first paycheck. <laughs> that was it. Dude, that is like that was like my only real job until, you know, after. I left the streets and that was, I mean, right. really, I mean, I, I was on paper and I had jobs, but I never worked. I got a paycheck, but I never like actually did worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I didn't do anything. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, I work for a lot of companies, warehousing companies, everything. I, I don't even know how to use a forklift still. So, <laughs> so when, <clears throat> so when you're, you know, this gap of time, I mean, that's when did you, after you, you know, you did your little early stuff, you know, when you started, you know, selling the cocaine, I mean, what, what came next after that and what people? Well, I, I still, I still work, but I started meeting more of those guys in there and mm-hmm. I started working for them. I started moving packages and moving product for them. Um, a lot of what I did is I didn't sell. Actually, I, I moved product. I would, uh, they had big like, cars that were load cars mm-hmm. and I would drive the car to wherever and then drop it off. But I mean, they were very sophisticated trap cars. They had, there's no way that any cop back then they would have never found it. Even if I got pulled over, which I didn't, I was, you know, very good at that. And I used to, you know, take it on the bus with my backpack and I had a, I didn't have a car. I mean, I wasn't able to, when I first started, I didn't have a car. I wasn't able to drive. I was younger than, than 16. And then when I was 16, I had a motorcycle and a car and then I would drive their load cars around and drop those. And that's where I made a lot of money. And that's where I was able to, to, to buy kilos of cocaine. And, and, and quite frankly, a lot of them, I didn't ever pay for They, would front them to me then I pay them back afterwards. Oh, so then that way you so. don't really have to do an official drug deal or whatever. <laughs> well, you know? no, they, they would, they would give me, they would give me like, you know, 10 kilos and then I would have to, I would have to pay them back the money in no time. But the, the rule in, in, in big dealing back then and, and, and drug dealing was the money and the cocaine and then money and the, the drugs are never in the same place at the same time because you could lose one, but you don't want to lose both. Right. And then if you have both, then the cops have a deal, you know, then they got the bust, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's more official, but, um, yeah. you know, so, so eventually you, you kept working and, uh, you know, you met some people with, within the Los Angeles mafia and I don't know, yeah. I don't know a whole lot about that. So like, who were some of the people that you made, you made connections with and, you know, what was your relationship well, with them? I, I met a guy, one of the guys I met was an associate of the LA family. His name was Mark Price, and he was a gambler. And he and then he introduced me. There's other guys that came down to the restaurant all the time, like this guy, Fad Bobby, uh, Mike Rizzi, uh, 
there was, he's a, he was a maid capo. There was a John Damati. Um, he's an associate. And I started meeting these guys. And through them, I, made a, I met a capo from, from the Los Angeles family from Buffalo, New York. His name was Jimmy Kachi. Vincent, Jim, Dominic Vincent Kachi. And they called him Jimmy. And uh, we became friends, close. And he was always in and out of prison. And uh, he he gave me like his number, his brother's number, and always keep in touch with them, touch base. And, and you know, he spent the the majority of Jimmy's life was spent in prison, especially that period of time. But we, I would always stay in touch. I would go visit him. I would send him stuff. I put money on his books. You know, whatever. And uh, we we were friends. And so I I just run around with all those guys. And in like 1989, um, I saw the writing on the wall. The the cocaine business was pretty much going down dead. Because we, we were getting, when I was first selling kilos, we would get $45,000 for them. Then we were getting like 30. Then we were getting 27. Then it was 22. Then it was all the way down to 11,500. And it's like, there's yeah. no money. I'm not yeah. taking a bus. Like, you know, we're not taking a, and then the time also, you started getting, they started giving out major time. So mm -hmm. we started, it started to be not worth it. So I just decided I got to get out of it. And, um, you know, I had money on the street because I was like, I would loan out money, Shylock it, and I was still doing the gambling. So, it was, like, I had other streams, but nothing that compared to that. And so I met a guy in my apartment complex in the gym who named, named uh, Peter North. And uh, he went by a different name back then. You know, he, he had a different name. And he was a, a porn star. One of my one of my friends with me recognized him. He was a porn star. And so he wanted to get into making movies. And so I, I decided to back him. And uh, I backed two two movies, which uh, we shot at the late comedian's house, Sam Kinison, and I paid everyone in cash with those. And then that's why I got started in that business. And that's what was your next venture, I suppose. And so you, yeah, and you yeah, it was it was the porn, and then I found out that I could use the organized crime ties, the mob ties that I already had, to sell these movies and get more involved because there were so many guys involved in that, and that's how I got really close to LA guys because of that. So what was their part in, in the whole scene? You know, the mob guys, you know, with, with well, the porn biz. Before the internet, like if you want to distribute, you had to go through like one of the families, like the Gambinos and the Columbos. They both, and they basically controlled everything in Chicago. The outfit controlled it. If you wanted to have a, a store there, you had to go through and pay street tax. Um, if you want to get your videos distributed, they had to go to wholesalers, which were all controlled by, you know, one wise guy or a guy representing a wise guy and it you just you needed you needed to have a connection and so this is way before the internet and so i got i just used connections that i already had to meet other people to distribute my stuff and get it out there yeah so they really helped you get make that connection and start getting it everywhere i mean where did you distribute to was it like all over everywhere. or just all everywhere over the all world over? Damn. all over the world yeah so yeah. it was a nation or worldwide business then that you had at one point. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was huge. I mean, I, I work with all these other companies. I work with a lot of companies in that business. But again, I got paychecks. I never did anything. Um, I was on set all the time. I took cash money and made movies, flipped it for checks. And, uh, you know, that's what I used to do. I used to, I got some of the Medellin cartel guys to uh, put up money for movies and stuff. And then we'd put cash into it and then get back checks and I'd give it to their companies. So, <laughs> so you had a pretty smooth operation for a while with it. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I, I had a problem all the time. I was always in trouble. Um, this whole time, I was always uh, ever since I was thirteen, I was always like locked up, um, out on bond, or on parole or probation, or waiting, going through another case every time. Never, I never had. I never. I was never free from thirteen till. I was about 38 years old, I think. Damn. That's a long time to go with that. Well, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say always, always on, on something. Always had to check in. Always had to, uh, you know, out on bond. I had to uh, take a drug test, whatever, you know. So it doesn't matter to me. I don't. I didn't take drugs. I don't drink. It doesn't matter. So to me, it's right. no big deal. So what were you just getting in trouble for? Just were you doing operations with like other, other things and then they would bust you or was it just simple? Dude, everything. Like <laughs> I got taken down for conspiracy to distribute cocaine. 
you know, mouth and mouth were talking about it. They didn't catch us with anything. I got caught with, uh, with, uh, a bunch of guns. Um, I got caught with, uh, a lot of, a couple of assaults of deadly weapons, assault and battery, a bunch of times. Um, I hit someone with a car. Um, let's see, you know, attempted kidnapping, uh, you know, like that. Mostly like assault and batteries and assaults is like my thing because, you know, I just didn't have a, had a bad temper and I just, yeah. just I just, didn't give you know, <laughs> no, I just go for it. You know, yeah, someone, someone, like other people in bars, you know, they're like, they work up to it. They're like, hey, they push you, push you. And like, I'm sober. I'm just knocked them out. And then, you know, I go to jail for it. And then <laughs> like, like a lot of times I was arrested and this would happen. But a lot of times, like most of the time it would, it, the charges would get dropped because they didn't have shit. I mean, the, the truth was the other guy started or, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah, yeah I, you know, I got in a fight and they're like, I, I fought four guys and I beat them up. Like, <laughs> I, like, you know, one person doesn't go and attack four guys. So, no, no. <laughs> but then, but see this, all this time cost me years and tons and tons of money. Oh, I'm sure with you all the legal I mean? fees, like, probation. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Like I was just wasting my money, wasting my life with this. It's just like, all this stuff, like, you know, all these busts and everything, you know, yeah. I would always get picked up and I, or I had to go to grand jury and then I didn't say anything. And then again, got a, I got locked up, you know, and then had to pay all this money to try to get out and try to do everything. And then to see the, the, the FBI and the, and the narcotic suppression squad and all of them, they knew that, but they just wanted me, they just grind you down and take your money. That's how they take your money. They make you pay, 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 pay. Mm-hmm. And that's how they get their profits, huh? <laughs> that's that's how that's how they keep you off the street too. It's just like by constantly doing this. Yeah. So after after that, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you had, I mean, okay. So the way I can kind of structure this is like, uh, you know, you're uh, half Italian and half Japanese, right? Yeah. So did you have uh, when you you know growing up? I mean, did you want to get involved with the you know the mafia? You know, I mean, because you never would be um, able to become a made man. You know what I mean? No, I, I wanted to be involved with, with organized crime, and mm -hmm. they're the best. I mean, you know, at, at that point in my life, that's what I wanted to do, and I like them the most. They're the most businesslike. I'm there. I'm. I was there to make money, so I would like be. You know, like I like Jimmy Kachi. I really liked him, and so I would do things with him and, and other people. And I just only cared about. Only thing I cared about is making money and just, you know, doing my thing. Yeah, and you know when you you eventually even gained ties with the Colombo family, you know. So w when did that happen? Well, I met Colombos first through um, through the porn business, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I met a, I met a Colombo associate named Jerry Zimmerman. He was close to Sonny Francis and Michael Francis. He was he's in Michael's book, Quitting the Mob, and uh, he was out in California. He made movies and everything, and so he introduced me to a lot of people. And one day when I was at um, Jerry's place jerry wasn't there and and uh i answered the phone and sonny francis called collect from prison and uh he, he gave me a name of a guy and he told me to uh give it to jerry and the guy was going to come by and then uh you know that's how i just met people and then jerry sent me down to florida i met more colombos down there working with them running doing some porn stuff with them and doing other things in south florida and then i just kept meeting more colombos and then i met younger ones um, and they asked me if I wanted to move to New York, but I, I, I used to just go to New York. I used to go to New York a lot. And then I would stay in a hotel and, um, I would just hang out with the guys in Brooklyn and, uh, I'd spend like three weeks there and, and, and then come back home. And then finally they're like, Hey, you should move here. And then I was like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, cause if you're going to, if you're going to do this, you got to do it big. So like before like this. I was in like the Anaheim Angels. Let's say baseball analogy here. I was in the Anaheim Angels. Now I'm, at, I'm getting asked to go to the to the Yankees, the New York mm -hmm. Yankees. That's the difference. The LA Mob, the Colombo family. Now I'm with one of the five families. So I said, sure, I go. So I, I they they decided the guy that I I was talking with, you know, made a call, talked to Teddy. Teddy Teddy Persico Jr. was in prison. He was facing. He would he had been convicted of uh, some coke dealing in. Uh, in the eighties and he had got 25 year sentence and he was like, I don't know, 15 years into that sentence maybe. And, uh, he called and, and, uh, I had talked to him on the phone 
and uh, he made he they, some people had visited him, arranged it, and then he arranged it with someone else so that they they talked to LA guys, and then I went with the guy. I became you know part of his crew, but he was in prison, and um, I went. I moved to New York, and then while I was in in New York, after a year, two years, I think they changed the law, the Sullivan laws in New York, the drug laws. And Teddy was able to get out and see that we didn't know that was going to happen. And then he got out and then he was on the street and, you know, by that time I had uh, already flipped and I was already wearing a wire. So like, you know, I hadn't at that point, I had no choice, but to wear it on Teddy and um and the rest of the guys because i was already wearing a wire you know a lot of people they get in trouble and then uh and they they go to the fbi or whatever and you know there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people flip i don't ever judge anyone on why they do it because everyone's story is different and my story is different it's like this um the fbi came to me and i was i think about 28 years old and uh they said they said to me, like, look, we watch you all the time. You work really hard. You just, you know, you'd be a millionaire if you worked as a garbage man or something, you know, but you're just, you just like waste your life. You're going to end up going to prison for the rest of life or you're going to die. You're going to get killed in the street. And I'm like, well, I don't want to rat out my friends. They're like, we don't even really care about your friends. We care about all the other places you visit. We want intelligence in all these places, all the clubs and everything else you go to. And I said, nah, I don't really know. And then I'm like, what do I get? And they said, there's only the only thing you're going to get out of this is you're going to get a fresh start. And, um, I thought about it for like about a, two or three minutes. And then I'm like a fresh start. And they're like, yep, you're just going to, you're going to be able to put this all behind you. And I said, all right, I'm in. They're like, what? And, uh, I, yeah, I, I make decisions like that quick. And I, and I was looking for, I wanted to get out. I was tired of it. I was over. It's not, it's not what everyone thinks it is. Everyone's not your friend. Um, it's petty jealousy. It's, you know, you're, you're in a den of thieves and everyone's ratting off everyone anyway. What difference does it make? And, uh, there is no loyalty. It's all, it's all, it's a lie. And, uh, I was looking for a, a new start and there's only one way I can get a new start really is, is, you know, going that route. So I decided I would wear a wire and I asked the FBI, well, how long am I going to have to do this? And they told me, well, it's going to be six months, maybe a year tops. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. And, you know, eight years later, I'm still in it. So Damn. that's that's how that thing went. So <clears throat> those eight years, I mean, what did it look like? I mean, what was, how did, what were the beginning stages, you know, that they had, that you were doing and, you know, giving them intelligence? Yeah. I would just like wear a wire and uh, tape, tape other bookies, other big bookies, guys that are running stuff internationally. Like they had a, uh, uh phone rooms, wire rooms down in uh, Central America and different places. And I would give them that network and their banking networks. And I would go to different places like different strip clubs and different uh, clubs around the country and then give them intelligence on who's, what crew's in there, what they're skimming, that kind of thing. And then I would go back to Brooklyn and I would get intelligence on, even because I was friends with not just Colombo guys, but like different families too, like Genevieve family, um, I used to go hang out with some of those guys down in the Bronx at that Balsamo's funeral home, Italian American club down there. I would go to um, different places, like to the Banano Club, and go to another place called Bamonte's where they had the shape of like Nikki Santoro was there. And I would just give intelligence on what other who was in the crew, who was doing what, and they would show me pictures and say, "Did I meet this guy? Yeah or nay? And what's he into?" And um, that was, and then, you know, like construction, some of the union stuff they were doing. And I, that's what I was doing for the most part. And then when I moved there, then it became like a full-time endeavor, which I, you know, I didn't really, that wasn't really what I anticipated doing, but whatever, I did it. And um, it got to be so crazy that I, I couldn't like, I'm like, I don't want to stay here. Like I, so they would pay for me to fly back to California one for one, five days or six days in a month. And then I would just, you know, chill in California and Newport and then uh, fly back in, to New York and then get back in the, get back in the groove. Damn. Um, so do they, do they pretty much pay for everything then and get paid for giving this to get, I mean, cause you did it for eight years or did they let you keep some, 
money or how did no i paid my, my my money came like from my own work and my own businesses and everything and then they they would pay me for my expenses and stuff and then they they pay for my plane flight clearly because i didn't want to be there really i, I kind of wanted to quit after a while after like a couple of years i was pretty much over it and like i was over being around those guys i mean some of them I liked, like Teddy, I really liked. This other, this other capital, John Bodanza, I really liked. But for the most part, they're like meatheads and they're really, you know, not smart and not someone I really wanted to hang out with and do my time with. And it was hard for me to like listen to their crap and then not laugh at them because they were so dumb. So, so eventually you just got really worn out and over, or burnt out on the, on all of it. Yeah. And you just really didn't. Yeah. yeah. And I, I got burnt. I got burnt out because it's not like it's not like how they everyone thinks that these people are. They're not like brilliant people. Well, no criminals are like brilliant people. It's just in regular society, people aren't just brilliant. People look up to the wrong people. You think that something is one way, but you're really looking out from the outside. You don't really see. You see the glamour, but I was it's the grind. It's the daily grind, the life. And yeah. uh, I I just got I just was over it. I I just couldn't do it, and I was just just beat me down warm me down i just didn't want to do it yeah i mean you, people really i mean to think about it i mean imagine being around a group of people every day that you don't really care to associate with or people that you don't like it's definitely gonna <laughs> cause some issues you know and make you you know really irritated pissed off and just burnt out and not really give a shit about what's going on or life or anything i mean it's, it's i'm sure it took you know quite a toll on you for doing that for eight years it, it took a big toll. I just didn't, you know, a lot of these people I really didn't like, and I had to pretend like I liked them. Yeah, so it was just you forming know? fake yeah. relationships, you know, that weren't Yeah, but, I, it, but also it's, like, really annoying. Like, some of these guys I just really wanted to punch in the face, you know? It's like, and I couldn't, and it's like, and I did, I, like, in my in my real life, I would never associate with them. Right. But I had to, so I did it. I did my, I did what I was supposed to do, and then it, and then, like, you know, I just all, I blew it up. I just like blew it up and then like I got out finally. Like, so what was that? There were, uh, you know, so I know from like past interviews and stuff, I heard you talk about, you know, with uh, Teddy, you know, uh, what was it? You know, about a hit that you were supposed to go and do. And this is what kind of led to the, the ending of your being an informant, right? Yeah. What happened is Teddy was mad at a guy who was with another Colombo guy who he was mad at because the guy had, had something to do with trying to kill his dad. So he, we were eating and then he was taking, he was taking me home and I was in the back seat and there was another guy, Eddie with him. And I got out. And when I was almost in the door, he, Teddy goes, get in the car, get back in the car. So we got back in the car. He's called his brother. He tells his brother, get, get, get the tools, bring them over to mom's house. And we're going back. He's like, we're going to deal with this shit today. And he goes, and I'm going to get some. And he goes, and he, and he told me, he goes, Craig, this other guy, Craig Reno, he goes, he's, he's just like, he's just like the other guys. He's, you know, made guy. And uh, the other guy, well, you don't care about it. He goes, you got a problem with it? And I go, no. So we go to his mom's house. We were there for a while. His mom's like giving me water and everything. His brother comes with his box of guns and stuff. And he, uh, they, they, you know, they, the brother doesn't have gloves. So Teddy's like to his brother and this other guy, Walter, take off your socks and clean it and you drive and he's going to clean. And then Teddy got a gun and uh, out of the box. And then the other guns in there, they didn't have any bullets for it. So he's like, well, can't you make them fit? I'm like, no, man, it's just, it's not going to work like that. And so he goes, you got your knife? And I go, yeah. So he goes, you're going to watch, you're going to stand up by the restaurant. If any, I'm going to take him down by the water. If anyone comes your way, you got to take deal with it. I'm like, yeah, Okay, so Eddie looks at me when we're in the car. He goes, if shooting starts, duck. And uh, we were driving there, and Teddy's like, hey, man, you're being real quiet. I was being real quiet because that's how I process things. And second of all, I was recording the whole thing. And uh, I was just trying to get it all. And so Teddy's like, yeah, we're going to do this. And, like, you know, he's calling his other brother. He's telling him to get him down there. The guy doesn't want – at first he wanted to try to get him towards his mom's house on the street, but the guy didn't want to come there. He knew. And then we, we got him to go to this restaurant. So we're on their way to the restaurant. And as we're coming over the hill to this restaurant, there's, there's a full, like, hook and ladder fire department guy, you know, and, the, and a paramedic and ambulance and an NYPD car right there in front of the it, – it's at the restaurant next door to the restaurant we're going to. 
And I, in my in my head, I'm like, oh, the FBI is listening to me. Yeah, you know? that's what like, I was gonna say. Yeah, I'm like, wow, this thing really is working. And because uh, <laughs> I was like worried the whole time, like, what am I gonna do? How you know, I'm not supposed to be involved in any violence. And and I, you know, I was thinking in my head, do I stab this guy in the neck? You know, I'm gonna have to kill both of them because I'm and save. Craig and and the other guy because they're kind of shit bags anyway. I didn't really I didn't know what to do and I was like trying to figure it out in my head. And then this happened, and I was like, "Wow!" And Teddy starts freaking out like, "We didn't even do anything. The police are already here. The ambulance is already here." <laughs> and I watched them wheel out a guy. Some guy had a heart attack next door, and yeah. uh, they're wheeling him out. And then he goes, "Okay, you tell my brother Walter that it's off. I'm going to take the guy down by the the river. I mean, down by the water anyway." And I go, "Okay." So Teddy gets the gets Craig and they're walking down by the water. I look across the street and I see Walter and Carmine with the sock on their hand. <laughs> and I go, I start waving at him. I'm like, it's over, it's over. And they're like, well, Teddy said no. We got it. I go, no. He told me to tell you no. And he's like, we're gonna do it. I'm like, no. He told me no. And they're like, uh, and so finally I found his brother Danny and I go, Danny, go tell him that that Teddy told me tell him. The, and so he went and told him and they went home. And then. <laughs> that was like the thing, like Teddy dropped him to the house. But after that, people like Teddy was being groomed to be the boss. Like I, I believe now he is the boss. Um, of the Columbus. You know, he was, at, yeah, he was the street boss before. And I think now he is the boss and uh, he was being groomed to be the boss. And so they didn't like that. I was with him and I knew that stuff about him. So that people were getting angry with me. And uh, like a week later, I got called to a restaurant and I went to the restaurant and it was, it's, they put me to this deserted section of this diner, it's right out of the freeway. And ma- this guy Manny was in there, and he's asking me if I told people that he was laundering money for me. And he was like, um, you know, Teddy and Eddie, and th- they said this. And I, I was, I felt like I started smirking to myself because he's saying all this shit. And because I was like, bro, I could just play the tape back for you. I never said that. You know, <laughs> like I knew in my head, I never said it. And he, and he goes, he saw me smirking, and laughing at him. And he goes, he goes. uh, you fucking smirking at me. You're laughing at me. He goes, if you don't wipe that smile off your face, I'm going to punch you in the face. And I go, if you punch me in the face, I'll knock out all your teeth. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> and he goes, you'd raise your hands to me. And I go, dude, in a fucking 10 seconds, the meeting's over. I'm not fucking dealing with your shit anymore. And so I tried to, I got up from the table and he, and like, I just started walking outside and he started to, to follow me. And he like tried to grab my arm, I think. And then he, he got out and he started going to his car and I started going to my car. And because in my car, I had electric stars. I started the car and in the, underneath my seat, I had a gun. And so I was like, fuck, this is going to be good. I, and it was like, and then behind my car, I could, there's an abandoned gas station and behind the gas station, I saw this, this kid, Walter and another guy from the neighborhood in a Honda, a small little car. Now there's no chance that these guys were just hanging out there. You know what I mean? It was like no coincidence. And this is like a little car I've never seen anyone in before. So I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm like, my heart's beating so fast. And I'm like, if I could just get, I have like 30 steps to get to my car. And I'm just going to pop open the door and grab that thing. And once I got that, I'll be good. And so I'm like, boom, boom. I'm waiting for the shots to come. Nothing's happening. Manny tries to grab my arm and pull me into his car. He wants me to drive with him to stand out. And I'm like, no, fuck that. So I got my car. Locked the door. I had the gun in my in my hand. No one saw it, but I just had it down below. And I just turned around and went over this thing, and then out into the street. And got on the, on Belt Parkway, and then drove to Manhattan. And um, I was like, "Fuck that! I'm never going back." Manny called me. I'm like, "Fuck you! Fuck you! You piece of shit!" And then the FBI is like, "Yeah, we're gonna have to, probably gonna have to take you out of here." And then uh, they sent me up to, uh, or I went up. To, I was going on a trip to Toronto. And then when I was in Toronto, like Eddie and them were trying to find out what hotel I was staying at. And I, t- I told them like, please, everyone, because I'm not stupid. And yeah. uh, I, I just pretended like, you know, like I was like, oh, yeah, I was coming back. And the FBI told me you're never going back. And then I ended up staying up there for three weeks. And from there, I just was on a, a plane flight, plane flight, plane flight, hotel, hotel, until I got to a safe house. So that was all I did. Debriefing. Damn. So did you, did you ever got to go and testify on the stand against these guys? No, they all pleaded out. I, um, I went over all the tapes every day and they went to grand jury. I was debriefed by like, you know, for hours, 18 months I spent in, 
in that uh, in safe houses by myself. And, uh, you know, then I was done. Damn. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, after that, I mean, these guys, you said that, uh, let's see, Teddy was, you, you think he's the boss now? I mean, even after, you know, the, that assassination attempt that you had on, you know, tape, he never had to go to prison or anything again for it? Oh, yeah, he went to prison. He's been to prison twice for my tapes already. He went for, like, like six years and then 12, like, I think he got 12 and he got out in eight. And he's, he's back right now locked up, but he's got, you know, he's not facing a long sentence. And he was, he was under boss, acting boss. And they had older guy then they were working on if, if when Andy Mush, Andy Russo, Andy Mush, when he, uh, when he, when he stepped out, Teddy was going to be boss for sure. But then Andy died. So I'm, I'm pretty sure Teddy's boss now. Damn. Isn't that something, man? You put away the boss of the Colombo crime family. I mean, yeah. that, the official boss is that's what that is, right? Like he's yeah. the boss of yeah. the whole boss, not just a capital. Yeah, because Car- Carmine's dead. I mean, his cousin, um, he might be the cousin because he's in prison for life too. Carmine's son, Alley Boy, he might be boss, official boss on paper forever, but Teddy will be the actual boss on the street and boss, you know, Damn. if he's on there. So that's the only that's the only difference it would be. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, do you worry about any of these guys coming after you now? No, not at all. Because how, how many I of mean, them did you put away with your tapes? I put a lot of them away. Like, you know, a lot. A lot of people all all, over, all across the country, like 60 people total, I think. Um, but, I mean, I don't care. You can't live in fear. I never, I, I lived on the street, you know, when I was in that life, and people were trying to kill me. So, what's the difference? I'm not going to live in fear, you know? I see those guys. Hey, whatever. Big, let's see what you got. Mm-hmm. Out of sight, out of mind, though. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's already damage already been done. What are you going to do? What are you going to accomplish? You're going to get yourself in trouble. So, you know? Yeah. And and so, did you ever uh, run into any of these guys since then? I mean, yeah. Sixty yeah. of them. I mean. Yeah. How many of yeah, them would you say? What? How many would you say that you've ran into? I ran into like four of them, five of them. I think. Really? Damn. How did that encounter go? Nothing. They were respectful. Yeah, no, they're respectful to me. I mean, they're like so. A couple one times, a guy threatened me. Uh, he brought a message from another Colombo Capo in Los Angeles, and I was training an FBI agent. And the guy heard it, and I'm like, "Dude, don't arrest the guy. The guy's an idiot." He just giving the message. He goes, "Yeah, but it's a crime." So they made it. They made it. Another time, people threatened me on the phone, and they went and they got them. But the people that I saw, like someone would say hi, and some didn't say anything. Wow, so you, like you, you, you gotta you you gotta remember most of these guys they can't fight anyway. I'm a Brazilian jiu jitsu black belt. I'm a boxer and a kickboxer. I train professional fighters, world champion fighters. Damn. I, you know, there's there's nothing there's not there's nothing they're gonna do to me. I work with with you know I trained with uh, UFC guys like on a UFC team at Rain Training Center. I worked. I was on the fight team. I I was a, a instructor there. Like, dude. I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I could like snap their neck in two seconds. Really, seriously, <laughs> not a big deal. Damn. You know? Hey, I trained with a guy from Nebraska, Jake Ellenberger. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Was, so, you, so you you got yeah. your own gym? Is that what it is now, or what yeah. you got? Yeah, I have my own, I have my own gym. I I uh, I I, w- I mean I I was living in Los Angeles afterwards, and uh, I was living in Hollywood, and I was I was training uh, world champion fighters and. Uh, actors and actresses yeah. and um i just burned out in la and the whole i was doing the whole hollywood thing i was writing some screenplays and and working for people and uh i just got burned out in it and i decided to come to the midwest and you know try farm life and i i really liked it and then when i i was when i first came out i wanted to open uh i didn't want to open a gym i just wanted to find a place to train and maybe i could train some people you know, in exchange for letting me train there and getting my own training in. And um, there was not really any place that I, around that was good. And um, some people close to me had Parkinson's and someone showed me a thing I can do rock steady boxing and teach them and, and help Parkinson's people. So I looked, started looking for a gym. We found a location and um, I started training like rock steady boxing, uh, Parkinson's patients. And then I, and I opened it up for everyone else because then I could pay the bills with that. 
And then I started training uh, just regular people. And it just kept, you know, it's just grown and grown and grown. So this is, you know, what I do. Yeah. And you made a negative into a positive. <laughs> yeah. After yeah. all that, after everything you've been through, now you're legit. And you wrote a book as well. Uh, kind of talk about that. Yeah. I mean, I wrote, I wrote Break Shot. I wrote it with a, a guy named Matt Randazzo. Um, he's a writer. He's written some other books. Um, I've written him and I've written a couple things. I wrote, I wrote another book. I just haven't published it yet. Um, mm. Just mostly about my, about my journey and like afterwards and what I did and like, you know, like um, how my life changed. And like when I first, when I first got out of the, out of the life and when I was first getting out of the life, I decided that um, I was just going to be like a good person and not commit any crimes. But yeah, I was like, not committing crimes, but I was kind of like the same. All I cared about was money. I would make money and whatever. And I put that above everything else. And I started being like, oh, well, I'll just be good, you know, karma. And then it just, my life wasn't complete. And then I, I, one of my clients gave me a Bible. Another one took me out to lunch and he told me that he was a Christian. And I was like, oh man, I got stuck going out to lunch with this guy. And he's just going to, he's going to pound this into me, but he was a really nice guy. He's an actor and he's like a really good guy. So I was like, okay, I'll listen to him. And then all he did is tell me his story. And then we ate lunch. And then I decided I wanted to I would go to church again. I had been to church, you know, I was, when I was a kid, I went to church all the time until I was about 13. And then, you know, clearly I quit and I started going to church again and uh, changed my whole life. And, and uh, now I know that like, even, you know, when I was on that hit with Teddy, that, you know, it wasn't the FBI and it wasn't coincidence. It's like, you know, God was looking after me that day and, you know, no one was killed and, and I had other things I need to do in my life. And now I'm trying to help other people and help other people succeed. I don't really train that many kids, but once in a while, uh, young guys will come in and, you know, 16, 17, and they'll want to do it and they come in on their own. They'll email us. And I'll take him in. I'll, I'll train him. One guy fought Golden Gloves. Now he's in the he's you know in the Army Ranger program. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple guys guys came in. One guy's a SEAL now, Navy Navy SEAL, like a real SEAL. Like he got his trident. Um, I got another guy that went to the Army. So I try to I try to help a few people. And I help the Parkinson's people. And I try to get my story out there. I try to talk about. It. I put positive stuff out on social media. You know, um, I don't post that much anymore on Facebook. I, I post on um, Instagram and I post on Rumble. Um, I do podcasts like yours, other people that where I'm not just talking about the same old thing, you know, and uh, I like to talk about, yeah, I like to talk about like what I've done after it's been like, you know, I left in 2005 was the last time I was in, well, the last time I was on the street and broke, but I've been back since then. But, uh, you know, I needed to change. I wanted to change and, uh, just not talk about, I didn't want to have like an, a YouTube show or something where you just talk about the same crimes with, uh, with mob guys. And it just wasn't, wasn't for me. And that's why I didn't want to be in Hollywood anymore. I didn't want to write about it and just constantly talk about crime shows. And, right. uh, you know, now I've changed my whole life. I came out here, I own a gym. Um, I train people. I blacksmith. I learned how to blacksmith, you know, I'm like, you know, do my thing. I like it out okay. here. Yeah, no, I mean, that's good that you really have something to, you know, even help with uh, people, you know, in general, you know, like the gym, you know, like you said, with the yeah. Parkinson disease and stuff. I mean, that probably really helps them out a lot because, <clears throat> you know, I got that's in my family, um, Huntington disease. It's like similar to Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you heard of that, yeah. but yeah, I know, know it is. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that runs in my family and stuff. So, you know, go, going to a gym and stuff like that, you know, can really help with their movement and you know, really, you know, really, really just really help them, you know, mentally as well too, because, you know, yeah. with those kind of diseases, they really eat at you physically and mentally. And then on top of that too, you got, like you said, you helped out them kids and, yeah. you know, they, they kind of, you know, they, they took an interest into the, you know, physical fitness and stuff and went in and became one of them became a Navy SEALs. I mean, that's, it's pretty impressive, man. Instead of, you know, going yeah. out and doing criminal stuff. I mean, right whether you, you help plant seeds you know what i mean and and they're good seeds you know what i mean instead of like bad stuff that, that that's all i'm trying to do and like with the parkinson's parkinson's brings you in i try to get them back the balance and the movement and the mm -hmm. you know the boxing 
boxing yeah. helps them. I, and what I did is when I, when I trained people in California, my deal was, and the guy who taught me was like Manny Pacquiao strength, strength and conditioning coach. And so like, I was really into the, into strength and conditioning. I work on balance. So I work on balance with all these older people. Um, I have six Parkinson's classes a week. Um, mm. I got about 30 Parkinson's boxers. Wow. We, uh, we help them, you know, they can move. I got guys, I have guys in there that are 80 that can jump rope. So that couldn't <laughs> barely, they could barely walk when they first came in. Then I have other people that are just, I call it silver gloves that are just older and retired. Mm -hmm. And I think we got about, I don't know, 15 or 20 of those people. And again, <laughs> we're just helping them balance and do stuff. We, we, you know, we're a place you can come and talk, uh, you know, people, you know, I'm in boxing, but I've never, like I'm in LA, I never encounter people crying to me in the ring but i have now and i you know i deal with it it's just a place that you can get together and not just be all by yourself and uh i get and then like i said i have the younger people that i work on and like you know if the guy wants to do it and they want to do boxing and they want to they want to compete if they want to do kickboxing or mma i would help them if as long as they're going to do it on their own you know and if right. it's their own deal i'm not pushing you into doing it and you want to you show me that you show up day after day yeah i'll help you i'll put my time in it i mean it's like for me to train someone like I, in California, I would get paid hundreds of dollars for like an hour. And, Dang. uh, but so for me to train a, a golden gloves fighter with, with, for no money is, you know, and go corner somebody. It's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of my time. So they have to show that they really want it, but I would, I do it because I know that I don't, I don't want them to become professional fighters. I want them to have that as a base and then they could use that because that, that dedication that commitment will bleed off into your other life. Like jujitsu, uh, it changed my life too. It did. It makes, it makes you so much more focused and you have to depend on yourself. There's no blame like this. You get caught, you get caught. It's on mm -hmm. you. Right. Better just better not make that same mistake. You know, just like this, I, I would make the same mistake like 10 times. And then after that, I'm like, okay, I'm not getting caught. And I never get caught in it again. You just, you have to learn, but jujitsu and, and like wrestling and grappling that takes it, it, it's a different mindset. Almost all the, the successful uh, people in the background in Hollywood, all the, the successful like people that run the studios and the, and, the, and a lot of successful businessmen that I met, in fact, were wrestlers and college wrestlers because you have to depend on yourself. And that's like probably what I like to try to instill in people is that you put your mind to it. You can do like I used to put my mind to like crime. And then mm -hmm. I decided like, hey, I'm going to really – like change everything and I'm going to put my mind to something else and then I accomplish it. And, uh, you've got to have discipline and dedication and, and, and yeah. you got to show up you gotta, and you got to be able to take personal responsibility for your life like this. You can't be a victim. You can't just be in victimhood. Like I take personal responsibility for everything that's happened in my life. I'd never look back and say like, Oh, it was my parents. They got divorced or, Oh, you know, I was treated like this or this one time someone called me this name, dude, it's all me. I've been called a million names and none of it. I grew up. Let me tell you, I grew up in, in, in a place that's all white. There was now there's a lot of Asians that live there, but when I was there, there was no Asian. And I heard every name in the book and guess what? I lived through it. It was no big deal. If I got in a fight with you, if, if I made a big deal about it, it's because I wanted to fight and I didn't want to get in trouble, but it all wasn't because right. I, I was offended because I called myself that or somebody, you know, or somebody else that in, in a second didn't yeah. offend me <laughs> didn't hurt no. my feeling believe me yeah. you know i would say oh you called me a jab whether they did or they didn't you know right. yeah and but guys do that anyway if they're my friend who cares <laughs> you know and yeah and, and and what you said too is i mean it's i really like what you're saying you know because you know with with fitness or whatever it may be you know you it really you have something to hold you accountable for something, you know, yourself and you want to continue yeah. to grow and be, be better. And you know that you, you can apply that skill that you learn, say, if you learned as a child, you know what I mean? When you're doing sports and shit, yeah. like you can, you can apply that to fuck you, like you said, and into the business world, into whatever, whatever the hell it is that you want to do. That's all you, you just have to use that skill. It, I mean, it's not the, it's not like, it's not the same as working out, but I mean, it's, it's the same skill. It's the same mindset, you know, and it, if you it, have that, it is the same mindset. It's like this. Okay. People always ask me all the time, like, or they tell me I'm going to write a book or I'm, I need to write a book about myself. How did you do it? I wrote it page by page. Yeah. We wrote it on a, a legal tablet. It costs, it costs like $3 for, for a pack, like 
now it might be more, but it was pack of four. And I just write. And then we put it, and then I type it up. And then I type it up. And I just did it every single day. Writing's like a muscle. It's like working out. You just got to do it. And people mm -hmm. don't want to do it. They're, you know what? And if, so what? Like, let's say you wrote like a 300-page book, right? Let's say, and so what? What it cost you? You learn something. And then mm -hmm. you get better at it. Yeah. And then you, and so what? It didn't cost you anything. Do it again. It's a hobby. Every day, right. every morning, every morning I wake up, I write something. I do something. And it, it doesn't, it, it, people just don't want to be dedicated to things. They always have an excuse. You know, I get up, yeah. I get up every single morning at 2 a.m. I want, I, I, I read the Bible. I walk my dogs. I write. I, I, I send out emails and, uh, I get to the gym. I'm there at 4.30 to open up by 5 a.m. class. I work yeah. out. I do my thing. I work out during class. I do jujitsu with people too. Like I roll or wrestle in between that. I box. Sometimes I spar. Like today I sparred. Um, and I do all my classes and I get back. I come, I come back home, shower, eat, relax, chill out, read some more, get back, go back to the gym and have a night class and, and uh, maybe a couple private, you know, do my own thing. And then, but I do it. There's no excuse like this. No one's ever going to go to the gym and it's not going to be open. I'm never right. late. You know why? Because it takes me 15 minutes to get to the gym. So I leave 30 minutes. Case, yeah. it, just in case. You know, even though there's not going to be any traffic here, I don't know because I live out in the country. It could be like snow. It could be ice. could be uh, harvesters in there. It could be combines, you know, on the road. I don't know. I'll just, I'll, I'll leave early. Right. And people, people today just want to make up an excuse. At least this is the only thing I could say about being in the mob. Back back in the old days when I had, when you had a pager, my guy would tell me, "We're gonna if, if I page you, I put the number in. You got to call back within five minutes. If you don't if you don't call back in five minutes. I'm leaving. So you want to stick around a payphone more than five minutes. You know what I mean? So, dude, I would be on the freeway in traffic. The pager would go off, and I'd be stuck. I'd pull over the side of the road, leave the car on the side of the road, jump a fence, and run to a payphone because there's no cell phones. I had to make a call back." <laughs> and, you know, when they would tell me, like, hey, we need you here at 5 o'clock tonight, I would be there at 4.30. Right. And, and if, I, if it was far from my house, I would say, would say it was an hour away, and I needed to be there at 5, I would leave at 3. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do that shit, too. I know what because you mean. Because there's, there's no excuse, man. But right. everyone today, when they want to work, they're always like, oh, well, I had this. Really, I don't care. Like, they would tell people, like, oh, my girlfriend's sick, my wife's sick. Don't care. Right. Don't care. You yeah. you got a job you got to do here. Don't care about your personal problem. And people just want to do that all the time. They always want to make an excuse. And you instead of just doing it, dude, it sucks. Nope. You know, like life 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 throws you all kinds of stuff. Like like this, I get I get hurt. Yeah, my leg hurts. I still go to gym. I go work out, and I still train everyone. Okay, maybe I won't do certain things, but I'm going to do something. People get sure. sometimes people people get hurt, and they're like, "Oh, well, a dog bit me at my hand." I like I heard this for real. A dog bit me at my hand, so I can't do this. Really, you got another one, and you got two legs. <laughs> you yeah, know, you're just looking for an excuse not to work out and not to do it. Oh, well, oh, it was it, it's the holidays, and so I just kept eating. Yeah, it's the holidays for me too. I, I like food. But I, I'm not going to, like, I, 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 I care about how I look and my personal appearance and my fitness and my health. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and people, people want to be victims and they want to make excuses and, and uh, you just can't do it. That's, that's, it's part of the thing. Like, it's, to me, it's, I, I tell Christians the same thing. It's part of being a Christian is, oh, well, you got to do this and this. And I'm like, well, dude, you should try taking care of yourself too. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> Yeah, God, yeah. God wants you to be healthy. Have a healthy body. It's not, you don't, they don't want you fat. You want to be healthy, and yeah. it's it, it's part of the whole thing. It comes in the whole thing, and like, um, you know, like I like I said, I don't drink, I don't smoke, but I don't care that anyone else does around me. It's yeah. it's, it's your own. You you make your, your own choice. choice. I'm not I'm not I'm not in charge of you, it, and if it doesn't hinder you in any way, like awesome, right. you know. But yeah. if you go overboard, if you go overboard, overboard anything, if you eat. Too many candy bars. It's just as bad Hard as if you drink like a case of beer, you know. Right. And so it's, yeah. it's like I don't look down at people. I don't judge people because it's not my place to do that. I'm still That's like right. I'll still be your friend. I'm just going to try to help you because and it, and it hurts me when you're like killing yourself, you know, not doing and you and like 
I try to help other people, especially younger people. I tell them, like, I want to see people reach their potential because I, like, I don't want them to be like me. I don't want them to, to deal with it. Look, at, I've already done all the bad stuff. I could tell you all the pitfalls that's going to happen. I've told kids recently at the gym, like, listen, you think you're smart. You think you're going you're gonna to beat the system. You're not. This is no. what's going to happen to you. And there's yeah. no, there's, there's no, when you're a criminal, there's no <laughs> great endings. It, that's a fairy tale. It's for the movie. Yeah. No, no. I, I, you know, I like what you're saying. You know I mean? It's true. You know, if, if someone really wants something, they're going to show up every day for it, no matter what, whether you're sick, you got COVID, whatever, whatever it is. If yeah. even if it ain't the gym, church, whatever, if it's working yeah. on videos or if it's, uh, yeah. you know, just any, any shit, you know, if you really want something, you're going to show up every day for it, no matter what. And that's what, that's what separates you from everyone else. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that separates yeah. you from who, who's going to really going to, go further with with whatever it is and yeah it, it could be anything it could, it could be welding it could be like farming mm -hmm. you got to show mm -hmm. up you got to do it you got to yeah. know it you got to love mm -hmm. it and if you make yeah. excuses of why you can't do it it's you're never going to succeed at anything if you can't just dedicate yourself and see it to the end like this there's, there's some things that i've started that i didn't want to do and i'm mm -hmm. like i won't quit though i'll finish it and every single time that i've done something even when i didn't want to I did it to finish. Right. It's I've always learned something and it's always a positive outcome. Right. So so many people just so many people start things now and then they quit. Yeah. Just see it to the end. That's all that's my favorite my, my thing I can say is like just see it to the end. And I always make myself do that too. I see yeah. it to the end. Even if I even if I just don't want to do it, I just will do it. Right. And even at the, even if even if you when once you get to the end, if you don't like it. Don't do it no more. And don't waste your time right. on it. You know what I'm saying? But you learn. But you when you like look it. when you look back on it, you've learned all right. these things. You you got something. You could always get something positive out of something that you've learned. Mm -hmm. Right. That's Even true. if you didn't want to do it at the beginning. Yeah. No, I, I agree with it, you, man. Yeah. But uh, do you, you got anything else you want to say before we wrap up? No, I mean, um, if anyone wants to check out my stuff, they can check out my book, Break Shot, or they can. Uh, I'm on Instagram, McKenzie OC, and I'm on uh, Rumble. I put up some videos, like one video a week, I think, just different stuff, my life and talking. And um, it's under it's under break shot. I just started a couple couple weeks ago, so you know, whatever. And okay. that's it. I'm writing more stuff. I'm gonna put out put out. I'll, eventually, I'll put out the other book when I'm done. Yeah, one of the times, right? You know what I mean? Because there's yeah, there's been a lot of shit going on since 2005. You know what I mean? That's 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know so yeah I, I, have, I have i have i have a whole another book and I, I have more stuff and people always people always ask me about like what happened to this you know that person i and, you know i've talked about it and uh i've already written it i just i just haven't done it i've just been uh you know doing so much other stuff i just haven't had time yeah to well, really promote it and everything yeah because yeah, that's what you'll want to do when it comes out and everything so you know just yeah. whenever the time's right you'll have the time and it, you, you'll 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 feel it you know what i mean yeah i know yeah. you come back to shit and it's just like all right well i'll put it out now you know but yeah yeah whenever you do i mean i'd love to have you back on the show man we could talk more and I really yeah no like problem we, it's great I, I really like how we we changed it around at the end too you know and talked about all this positive stuff as well because it's good for the people to hear you know what i mean good man that's that that's what i want to do my my biggest takeaway is like uh life short man you got to do it and just and it, dedicate yourself to something and see it, th see it through, see it through to the end. And yeah. even if you work, this is what I always tell people. Even if you work at a crappy job, you're not going to be at that same thing forever. If you right. do the best you can do at whatever you do, people will take notice of that. People will see that and you will move up as long as you do the best that you can do at whatever you do. You know what I'm saying? So like mm -hmm. if you're a dishwasher, be the best dishwasher and then you'll be a bus boy, be the best bus boy. Then you'll be a manager. You know what I mean? Like you people, they don't, no one wants to be an Indian. Everyone wants to be a chief now. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's insane, you gotta work man. your way up. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Kenji. Yep. Wow. I hope you guys all enjoyed this interview. Kenji has got one hell of a story. He's done some very insane things in his life. Kenji has now started over with his life and is on to bigger and better things. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, I'll be sure to include Kenji's book in the video description as well. I'll also include my clothing brand website in there if you want to support me. Please also subscribe to my channel if you want to get more interviews like this. And the last thing that I'll bring up is my mafia playlist i'll include that at the end of this video a playlist will pop up and you'll see all of my mafia related interviews i've done in the past thank you again so much for watching